And in one year, we've just uh, got a really good group. And we want to thank uh, Michelle and Eugene and the others, all the folks who've uh, practiced so hard. And I don't know how you felt, but I thought that Mrs. Batchelor was the best voice in the choir. Now, I don't know if you noticed that or not, but... And Nathan, he did okay, too. But uh, I'm not biased. Well, this morning we're going to talk about a theme that uh, is sometimes uh, addressed during this time of year when people are thinking about the first coming of the Lord. You know, we are we're excited about the second coming of the Lord, and we can learn some things about the second coming by looking at the first coming. And we remember the story where when the first coming of the Lord was announced, you read in Luke about those angels that saw it. And they had a message of peace. Our message today is dealing with the subject of how can we have inner peace? Who wants true spiritual inner peace? I thought I'd give it a very simple title because I want to share with you what the Word of God says on how you can have that peace. I suspect that um, a lot of people that go to church, a lot of people that have the name of Jesus do not have the peace of Christ. Is based on the statistics. So many people that go to the hospital are there because of stress and anxiety. Most of the medication that is sold is dealing with stress and anxiety. Anxiety, of course, being the opposite of that peace. And uh, Jesus tells us over and over again, he longs for us to have that peace. Well, we first read when Jesus came the first time about this heavenly message of peace when the angels appeared to the shepherds and it says in Luke chapter 2 verse 13 and suddenly there was with the angel this one angel gives the message and all of a sudden the skies peel back and there's a whole choir of angels a multitude of the heavenly host praising and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. And many in the world love to recite these words and talk about how Jesus came to bring peace on earth. And this is often misunderstood. We'll get to that in just a moment. But what's being offered to us when it tells us that uh, God is wanting us to have this peace? Um, it is true. God wants us to have peace on earth. But there will never be peace on earth until there is peace in us. One of the big problems with the world today is that people do not have peace, and that, that uh, then leads to all kinds of problems and anxiety and stress and war and death. And then first, we must have peace in us. What is peace? What is peace? Well, you've got the Bible word in Hebrew. You find the word shalom. Now, the word shalom is a, um, it's a very broad, encompassing word. It's kind of like if you go to Hawaii and they say aloha. They say aloha, hello, and aloha, goodbye. And aloha means love. But in Hebrew, the word shalom means peace, safe, well, happy, healthy, prosperity, or favor. It basically means anything good that God has to offer. I wish that upon you. And today it's even a common greeting among Jews. They see each other, shalom, shalom. And you find Jesus often saying that. Uh, you find the word peace in the Bible about 429 times. Now there's small differences if you're reading some versions. They may choose another word. But it's, it's a very common word in the Bible, peace. Now that's the Old Testament, shalom. New Testament, it's the word irene. And if your name is Irene, your name is peace. I don't know if you knew that. Any Irene's here today? It's not as common as it used to be. Or Mildred's, you got a Mildred out there? Well, those used to be popular. Winifred, you got a Winifred? <laughs> so yeah. But if I were to say Aaron, any Aaron's out there? No. Yeah, yeah, see, it's, it's, they're more common. But um, so that's what the word Irene is, the Greek word for peace, and it means similar, peace, prosperity, one, quietness, rest, to set at one. Uh, the dictionary definition of peace, freedom from disturbance, tranquility, a quiet and a calm state of mind. It is the opposite 
of anxiety, fear, turmoil, and anger. Now, I think we all want that freedom from anxiety, that peace, that calm state of mind. We're going to talk, this is a three-point sermon. I don't often do this. I usually have like 30 points. But I've got some sub-points in these three points. But there's really three points. We're going to talk about the wrong peace, the wrong kind of peace. We're going to talk about the right kind of peace. And then we're going to talk about the road to peace. And so uh, first, what peace is not? When the angels were saying peace on earth, they were not saying that they are hoping that the United Nations is going to find a solution. This is not the peace that the Bible is talking about. When we think about peace on earth, it's not that. Look at what Jesus says about the last days. He does not predict peace. And there'll be signs, Luke chapter 21, verse 25. There'll be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on earth, distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. It's talking about a storm. Men's hearts failing them from fear. Does that sound like peace to you? And the expectation of those that are coming on the world, it says the world's leaders will have perplexity. They can't solve the problems. They're anxious. Their hearts are failing with fear. Uh, the prophecies do not foretell a world in a state of bliss prior to the second coming. Jesus said, there will be wars and rumors of wars right up to the end. That's not the peace the angels were talking about. Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And notice what he says, not as the world gives do I give to you. He said, it's not the kind of peace the world gives that I'm offering you. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And then Christ says in, in Matthew chapter 10, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Now wait a second, Pastor Doug. Don't think that I came to bring peace. I thought Jesus, the Prince of Peace, came to bring peace. He didn't come to bring global peace among the nations. Matter of fact, he said, don't think I came to bring peace. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. This is not the peace that Jesus is offering. It's interesting, Jerusalem is called the city of peace, and it's been uh, destroyed by war and rebuilt 27 times. City of peace. Herbert Hoover said, peace is not ma made at council tables or by treaties, but in the heart of men. I always thought it's interesting that the peace prize was developed by the man who invented dynamite. Albert Nobel, or Alfred Nobel. So when we talk about the wrong kind of peace, the peace that Jesus is offering is not physical peace. We think, oh, if I just could have relief from my physical suffering, then I'd have peace. Well, it would certainly feel better to have that kind of tranquility. But um, Paul had a thorn in his flesh, and God said, I'm not taking it away, regardless of your faith, because it's through that you're staying humble. I remember going to the hospital when I lived in New Mexico. You've probably heard of La Vida Mission. How many of you have heard of La Vida Mission? We worked with them in the Navajo Reservation for some time, and uh, it was founded by a lady named Vida Shoulder. A lot of people don't know that who went to work among the Navajos a long time ago. We knew her later in life. She lived in a trailer right outside of our, our mission compound. Very sweet, godly lady, was a nurse, spent her life doing ministry among the Navajo people. When she got old, she was dying in the hospital from congestive heart failure. And I guess she had a lot of pain, struggling to breathe, um, a lot of angina pain. And I went to see her, and I could see her wincing, and I was not trained in hospital visits. I'm not really good at it, because I'll always say something like, how are you? You know, and they got all these tubes and machines and things, and I don't know what to say. And, and she said, I said, Vita, how are you? And she said, oh, God is so good. I'm so thankful. He's been so good to me. I can't wait to see Jesus. And I thought, you know, I, she, it was clear that she was suffering physically, but she had this inner peace that was not at all connected with her physical health. So when the Bible talks about peace on earth, that's not talking about peace in your body, though we all hope for that. We all hope that there's peace among nations. It's not even talking about domestic peace. Now, I pray that you've got peace in your family. 
And uh, Martin Luther said, to have peace and love in a marriage is a gift that is next to knowledge of the gospel. It is right up there with the, the knowledge of Christ and the gospel is to have domestic peace or peace in your family. But Jesus did not offer that peace. He said, uh, I've come to set a father against his daughter and a daughter against her mother-in-law, husband against wife, children against parents. Uh, unless everybody in the family has got Jesus in the heart, you're probably not going to have a lot of domestic peace. Some of you even have Jesus in your heart and you don't have domestic peace. So it's not talking principally about that, though I think we should strive for and pray for peace in our families. Amen? But that's not the peace that the angels were talking about. It's not financial peace. We all think, oh, you know, if we could just get the unemployment down, and it's down now, and inflation under control, keep interest rates low, have economic prosperity, we'd be at peace. And uh, for some of us, it's not just that the country would have economic prosperity. You would like to know that you've got plenty of money in the bank and you'd sleep better at night. A lot of people are anxious about finances. Well, I've got news for you, that if all your financial problems were taken care of, that would not bring you the peace the Bible is talking about. It's not a financial peace. A lot of wrong ideas about what this peace is. It's a, a lot of false concepts of peace. Ezekiel 13.10, because indeed they've seduced my people saying peace when there is no peace. We think just having, you know, a lack of strife means that you've got spiritual biblical peace. If your idea of peace is based on world conditions, you'll lose it when you turn on the news. If your idea of peace is based on finances, then when the stock market goes down, your peace goes down. If your peace is based on domestic bliss, then any argument in the family will rob your peace. True peace is not based upon external circumstances, but an internal relationship Amen. with the Lord. Some people try to escape their anxiety, and they get an illusion of peace because they're on medication. Now, I'm not saying that you know, there's some people who need to be on medication. And we're not recommending that you go off your medication and come here. <laughs> Try that somewhere else. <laughs> uh, so I mean, we're not talking about that, but you, let's face it, some people are medicated with drugs and alcohol, and they think, yeah, I feel pretty good. It's, there's a lot of people on their way to hell, and they, they've got an illusion of peace. It's like Peter sleeping on death row. Uh, a lot of people, the, the, the devil does... Um, he basically uh, inoculates some people or he um, injects people with this false sense of peace. I know a few people who are atheists and they seem very comfortable with it. I'm thinking, how can you have comfort with no purpose in life? 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, For men say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains. is not very comfortable upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. John Bunyan said, if we have not quiet in our minds, outward comfort will do no more for us than a golden slipper on a gouty foot. He's got a way of doing things, of saying things. So there's this wrong worldly concept of what is going to bring peace. Now, without keeping you in suspense, I think everyone knows what the right kind of peace is. It comes from God. Psalm 29, verse 11. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Someone said, peace is one of those things like happiness, which we're sure to miss if we aim at it directly. We find peace when we find God. It's like people say, I want happiness, and they strive after happiness instead of striving after God and holiness. And the way to find happiness is not by aiming at happiness, but aiming at holiness. Then you'll find the happiness. The way to find peace is not by looking for peace, but by looking for God, you will find peace. Did that make sense? And people often are aiming at the wrong thing. If your focus is on having God and having God inside, that will then result in peace for you. Job 22, verse 21. This is a great verse that really says it all. 
Acquaint yourself now with him and be at peace. As you are acquainted with God, that'll bring peace into your life. God is the essence and the source of peace. Matter of fact, seven times in the New Testament, God is identified as the God of peace. The God of peace, the God of peace, the God of peace. I think it says the Lord of peace once, and it says the King of peace once. But so seven times, God identifies himself as his very nature is peace. I know we like to say God is love, and that is true. But don't forget, he's also peace. Think about it. The worries in the world and the troubles in the world and the problems with sin and the wars and the sickness and the death. Don't think too much about it. It's depressing. But when you think about all these things that might make us anxious, now picture God. God is on the throne. He's the sovereign of the universe. Is God worried about the future? Why would he worry about the future? Does he know the future? Does he have power over all things? He's all powerful. Can you, in your mind, ever conjure a picture where God is wringing his hands, perspiration dripping from his forehead, his, his brow is furrowed, he's pacing the floor because he's wondering how it's going to turn out? I mean, you, when you think about it, it's really absurd to picture God as worried. So the closer you draw to Christ, and Christ is God, the more you become like Christ, the more peace you enjoy because you become Christ-like. And, uh, and the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. When you've got the mind of Christ and the mind of God, you're at perfect peace because you know that he's in control of all things, that, that he loves you and he has your best interest in mind and whatever's happening, as long as you're doing your part to walk in his will, you have nothing to worry about. That's a wonderful, liberating experience Amen. when you don't have to be afraid God is the essence of peace. You read in Romans 15, verse 33, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. God does not bite his nails. He does not pace the floor. He is the essence, the, the very uh, definition of peace. And the Lord even told his priests, he said, I want you to put my blessing on the people, and this is how you do it. Now may the Lord bless you. This is Numbers 6, verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. The peace. God's blessing is what? His peace. What could we want? I mean, the capital city we're going to live in through eternity is called what? The new Jerusalem city of peace. The destiny of all believers is peace. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth, and it'll, it'll be a kingdom of peace. Peace does not consist in the absence of danger, but the presence of God. Now, it, God does not want us to be anxious. Uh, two reasons. It's bad for you, and it's bad for others. Your anxiety is not only bad for you, your anxiety is bad for others. First, it's bad for you. God wants you to have peace. He loves you. Anxiety in the heart weighs a man down, is what Solomon said in Proverbs 25. Are you aware that heart disease, asthma, obesity, diabetes, headaches, depression, panic disorders, gastrointestinal problems, and accidents are all stress-related? I think the first five categories of disease that kill the most people are connected with anxiety and stress. Most of the medication that is purchased, as I mentioned, is stress-related. People are longing for peace. The, the entertainment industry, the whole idea of being diverted, diverted from what? Diverted from worries. People are looking for diversions because they have no peace inside. And so they go on these trips and they... They take the drugs and they sit and they're entertained for hours with binge watching to forget the anxiety because they're looking for peace. Peace is what God wants you to have. Anxiety is not good for you. In this confused world, some people have peace while others go to pieces. Peace has six enemies. Fear, greed, ambition, envy, anger, and pride. In fact... I was wondering if I'd remember to mention this. Yeah, 
Duke University did a study on peace of mind. Now, I'm not suggesting we get our peace of mind from the findings of Duke University, but this is what they came up with. Some factors they felt that contribute greatly to emotional and mental stability are the absence of suspicion and resentment. Nursing a grudge is a major factor in unhappiness. Well, the Bible says, forgive people. Not living in the past. An unwholesome preoccupation with old mistakes and regrets and failures leads to depression. A lot of people have no peace because of all their regrets and they're living in the past. Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind. Amen? Not wasting time and energy fighting conditions you cannot change. Cooperate with life instead of trying to run away from it. Some of you remember that old tranquility prayer, Lord, give me the, the wisdom to, oh no, it says, give me the courage to change the things I am, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. Something like that, right? There's some things you can't change. You just, you got to, you know, if you don't like that you don't have curly hair, don't go through life regretting it. You know, you spend all your time perming all the time trying to get that curly hair. And people just, they don't like the way they've been made. There's some things you may not be able to change. So just uh, be happy with that. Oh, wait, I lost my list. Force yourself to stay involved with living in the real world. Some people are anxious and they withdraw. Refuse to indulge in self-pity when life hands you a raw deal. There's problems that everybody encounters and there's misfortune that comes to all. Don't just continue to recycle your sorrow about those things. Cultivate the old-fashioned virtues. Interesting, Duke University saying this. Cultivate the old-fashioned virtues of love, humor, compassion, and loyalty. Do not expect too much of yourself when there's too wide a gap between self-expectation and your ability to meet those goals, you will feel anxious and a sense of inadequacy. Find something bigger than yourself to believe in. Ha, that's what the Bible says. Self-centeredness, egotistical people sco score the lowest for measuring peace and happiness. That's interesting. So, Anxiety is bad for you. Not only is a lack of peace bad for you, a lack of peace is bad for those sitting next to you. Your lack of peace is bad for others. Jesus has called us to be peacemakers. He wants us to be witnesses. If we have no peace inside, then how are we going to witness to others? If you say to someone, yeah, I'd like you to come to my church and be a Christian, and you are the most fretting person in the neighborhood, they're going to say, if I go to your church, will I be like you? But if you're a person and you've got peace and you've got a serenity and you've got a joy and they know there's something inside you where you're, you're centered in God, they're going to want what you have. Amen. And so by being anxious and fretful, it's actually just a bad witness. It's bad for you and it's bad for others. And the solution, of course, is by coming to God. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children or the sons of God. All right, I talked about what Peace isn't a false peace. And we talked about what is peace. Peace comes through God. Now, what's the road to peace? How do you find that inner peace? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, you can't have the peace without God. The peace that the angels sang about is a peace that comes from God. You don't get it without God. The peace of God then, which surpasses all understanding. The world does not understand this peace. It is not the peace of the world. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So what is the road to peace? It's praying, staying, obeying. This is a subcategory underneath the road. A peaceful Christian is a powerful witness. What we need is peace. <laughs> what we need is a peace conference with the Prince of Peace. The world is centered in self, which is misery. To have one's world centered in God is peace. Isaiah 26, verse 3, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. The meditation of the world is very different from the meditation of God. A lot of the people in the world, <clears throat> I 
heard about a friend who went to the doctor and he had a, a skin rash that persisted and he expected the, the doctor to, you know, give some medication and they said that the skin rash is actually caused from anxiety and he should think about taking up meditation. And some people take up meditation and yoga and they're looking for peace. Well, I used to be in that world long before I was a Christian and uh, it is very different from biblical meditation. The meditation of the world is you basically self-hypnotize yourself. You, you, you find some mantra or some word and you keep repeating this word until it just has no meaning and your mind becomes filled with a sort of a numb emptiness and you get this illusion of peace through just um, 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 you know, and then pretty soon it's like, oh, I think I feel much better now. Well, you've not dealt with the issues of life. It's just sort of like a self-induced hypnosis where you've got a peace because you've just become numb to the realities of life. That's the world's idea of meditation. You just refuse to worry about anything. God's meditation is not emptying yourself, but filling yourself with God. Amen. When the tranquility of God's spirit enters you, that gives you a real and a lasting peace. Amen. When a Christian stays his mind upon Christ, he develops a wonderful complex. A calm plex. You got that? I was wondering. Romans 8, verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There was a sign in front of a church that said, If life is a puzzle, look here for the missing peace. So when we talk about having peace with God, it's not just talking about a peace that you experience inside. It also begins with a transaction that takes place outside. We basically are at war with God before we're converted. You've heard about countries that decide to enter into a peace treaty. Before you're converted, you are the enemy of God. Now let me give you scripture because I know that that's not a happy feeling. Romans 8 verse 5. I'm sorry, rather, uh, Romans 5 verse 10. For when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So before we come to Christ, we have no peace because we're also God's enemy. So before you can have the peace of God within you, you need to make peace with God. How do we find peace with God? Through Christ. Christ offers himself as the sacrifice and the mediator that gives us this peace with God. Psalms 34, 14, seek peace and pursue it. Seeking after peace is actually seeking after God. Here it is in Ephesians. This explains the transaction. Ephesians 4, uh, 2, 14. For he himself is our peace, who's made both one. We were separated from God. And he's broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself a new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace. You notice so far? Three times. Peace, 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 through Christ and his sacrifice. And he preached peace to you who are far off and those who are near. I remember seeing a bumper sticker one time, now, this doesn't translate well if somebody's translating the sermon, but in English, it said, No God, N O, God, N O, peace. Then it says, K N O W, no God, K N O W, no peace. No God, no peace. No God, you no know peace. Understand that? <clears throat> And we're to stay our hearts on the word. And I told you it's through uh, the word of God. It's a staying, praying, and obeying. Stay your heart on the word of God. Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you. John 16, 33. These things I've spoken to you that you might have peace. Through things that Jesus says, we find peace. 
So if you want peace, read what Jesus said, and it'll give you peace. Some people have no peace, and they don't read the Word. There's so many times that Christ said, peace, 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 and you read the story in the Bible about Jesus is on the Sea of Galilee in a terrible storm, and it's dark, and they're cold, and the water's coming in. They're going to sink, and they're going to drown. They're going to die, and they're, they're so anxious, and they're so afraid, and they wake up Jesus, and Jesus says, peace. Now, in the Greek translations, peace be still, Jesus probably just said, shalom, one word, and the storm stopped. And then he said to the disciples, why were you so afraid? What is the Lord telling us here? He wants us to have his peace, where you could have peace through a storm. You've probably heard the story of how the Methodist church started with John Wesley and how John Wesley was converted, was in a storm. He had been doing mission work in North America, but he wasn't really converted. And on the boat back to England, after a dismal failure as a missionary, on the boat back to England, they encountered a terrible storm that threatened the whole ship, and water's coming in, and the sail ripped, and, and everybody's up on deck, and they're seasick and crying out for fear, and there was a group of Moravian Christians. There's like primitive Baptists from Germany, and they were up on deck, and the deck is swaying back and forth, and the waves are washing over and slapping the whole family in the face, and they're singing. And Wesley said, aren't you afraid? He said, we're not afraid. He said, aren't your wives and your children afraid? We're not afraid. We're in God's hands. We have peace in the storm. And seeing that changed him. He realized that he was missing that missing peace. You read in the Bible about Jesus and his peace in the storm, and those words inspire us. Oh, Lord, that gives me peace. I don't have to worry about the storm I'm going through right now. God is going to see me through if I trust him. You put it into practice. Acts chapter 10, verse 36. The word that God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. It's through the proclamation of the word we learn something about peace. I hope you get some of that today. Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing will offend them. When it says love the law, it doesn't just mean the Ten Commandments. This was called the law and the prophets. Great peace have those that love the word. Nothing will offend them. There's peace that comes from the Word. Some of us, the answer, we think it's in the medicine chest and it's really on the Bible on your shelf. The peace that you're looking for comes through the Word. Romans 10, 15. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. See, the angels were talking about peace through the gospel. It's through the words of the gospel. We have peace with God and that gives us peace in our hearts. So, it's through praying, it's through staying our hearts upon the word, and it's through obeying. The gospel has a message. It's a message of trust. And some people have no peace because they know they're living in disobedience. Now, I'm not going to pray that you have peace in disobedience. God loves you too much for you to be comfortable on your way to destruction. He wants you to feel conviction if you're living in disobedience. Amen? Amen. You don't want to be happy if you're lost, do you? You, you? Yeah, that's not good for you. It's like having a doctor that tells you that your skin cancer is just poison ivy. He's not helping you. We want to obey. Philippians 4, verse 9. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Notice, do the things that I've told you, and the God of peace will be with you. Isaiah 57, verse 21, there is no peace, says the Lord God, for the wicked. God doesn't promise peace to the wicked. Psalm 37, 37, mark the blameless man and observe the upright man for the future of that man, what do you think, is peace. Those who live an upright life, you have peace in your heart. Isaiah 48, verse 18, Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. The peace of God would just wash over us. It's like a river. He said, if you had heeded my commandments. Why does God want us to obey him? Because he's bigger than us or because he knows that that's the source of real inner peace? Isaiah 32, verse 17. 
and the work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance. You want that quietness? You want that assurance? You want that peace? Is there some area in your life that you've not surrendered to the Lord? You don't trust him and you're still in disobedience? And you're wondering why you still don't have peace? If you're walking in deliberate disobedience, that doesn't mean we don't slip and fall. The way to reestablish peace as soon as you sin, repent, renew the covenant, and he'll give you that peace again right away. Believe in that. But if you're living in constant disobedience to God and you don't have peace, that's the, that's the, the source of the problem. Erwin Lutzer said, emotional peace and calm come after doing God's will and not before. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And if he reigns in your heart, then his peace will reign in your heart. Romans 5.1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you've made mistakes, if you've sinned, and you want to restore that peace, believe. See, I... I talked about praying and staying, obeying, but it's also faith. You need to believe that God forgives you. Some people, they have surrendered. They're trying to obey God, but they just they can't forgive themselves. They need to believe his promise. Believe that he forgives you. John 20, verse 19, that same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. They're still afraid. Jesus came and stood in the midst of them, now, what do you think he said? Peace unto you. So, the very beginning, the angels introduced Jesus in the gospel story. They say, peace. After the resurrection, Jesus appears to the disciples, and what does he say? Peace. From beginning to end, his message was, he, want, he wants us to have peace. Peace. Again, he said to them, peace unto you. You go to verse 26. I'm still in John 20. Verse 26, Jesus came to the door, the doors being shut, and he stood in the midst of them, said, peace to you. So here you got three times. Peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. Now, if Jesus says, peace be unto you, is there creative power in his word? Amen. So when he says it, can it become a reality? Amen. The peace that Jesus offers is not subject to political change or domestic bliss. He had an internal peace in spite of the fact that he knew he was going to the cross. Inner peace comes from the Holy Spirit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. So if you say, I want the peace of God, what you're really saying is, I want the Spirit of God. Because if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will have peace. You can't have one without the other. When the Spirit of God comes within you, He gives you that peace. Romans 5, 1. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that one already. Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Notice, Holy Spirit, peace. Acts 9, 31. Then the churches throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace, and they were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They were multiplied. Peace, Holy Spirit. John 14, 26, Jesus said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Isn't that incredible that Jesus is talking about peace? John 14, when does that happen? Last Supper, John 13, he's washing the disciples' feet, right? That's true. Take my word for it. What's going to happen to Jesus the next day? He's going to be, well, that night he'd be betrayed and he'd be, you know, beaten and he'd be tried. And the next day he's going to be crucified. And yet he's able to tell the disciples, peace. I'm leaving you peace. You know, one reason he could offer us that peace is because he took all our turmoil. Amen. Wouldn't it be sad for Jesus to take all of your anxiety and you take it also? The Lord says, I will bear your burdens, cast your burdens upon me. Why would you want him to bear them and you're bearing them also? It's like carrying the same load twice. Let him bear your burdens. The Holy Spirit brings that peace. Peace I leave with you. Peace rules the day 
when Christ rules the mind. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I remember reading uh, about this ship. A submarine went out, and, uh, you know, when they first build one of these nuclear submarines, they take it on its trials, and they run it through a series of tests to make sure it's going to stand up in case it's ever in, uh, engaged in some war activity. And so that takes it on its trials. Well, submarines, you know, they actually go underwater, and the nuclear subs, they can stay underwater for months if they've got the food. They recycle, they purify their own water, they purify their own air, they get nuclear power, they're, they're never short on power. And heard about this submarine that went out and is going through trials. They're out of communication when they're down deep enough. They don't run an antenna. Yep, they don't get internet below sea. You know that. There's no connection down there. And so after going through the trials, the submarine comes back up and it goes to port. And uh, they said, how did you guys manage through the hurricane? You know what the submarine said? What hurricane? Oh, it's that hurricane that sank the Navy. No, it didn't sink a Navy, but you know, a hurricane, Category 5, can sink a Navy and it won't hurt the submarine. Why does it not hurt the submarine? Because the submarine's already sunk. <laughs> Isn't that right? And if you are crucified with Christ, then what can the devil do that takes away your peace? The Bible says that um, you can't really hurt a person that has surrendered to the Lord that has been crucified with Christ. Jesus said, do not fear him who destroys your body. He says, you don't have anything to be afraid of. He can't touch your soul. Now, I remember reading about a, um, one of the great reformers. His name was Nicholas Ridley. And uh, he was ultimately burnt at the stake there in England, Latimer and Ridley. Uh, they were Protestant reformers, uh, great theologians, actually bishops of the church. But when Mary came into power, she was of the Catholic persuasion, and she burnt all of the Protestant sympathizers, especially the leaders. And there was a lot of, uh, a lot of executions. As a matter of fact, I've been to Oxford in England. They still have a plaque on the ground there on the street, and it'll say this is where Latimer and Ridley were executed. They were burnt alive for their faith. Well, the night before Nicholas was going to be executed, one of his family members came and he said, I've come to sit with you through the night. <clears throat> he said, I really hope you won't. He said, I was hoping to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> Someone said, uh, a clear conscience makes a soft pillow. In 1555, when uh, Ridley and Latimer were burned, Ridley said to Latimer, he said, I believe that we're going to light a fire in England that's going to change the course of history or something that, and they prayed together. You've heard about the, many of the martyrs who sang. You've probably heard about the martyrs that were killed by the lions or gladiators in the Colosseum. And uh, they had absolute peace. And instead of the Emperor Diocletian exterminating Christianity, when he would publicly execute the Christians, the people watching the executions were so troubled by their peace, they would then go find a Christian and say, tell me, what is it you believe? So the peace of the Christians actually spread the gospel. Amen. They weren't afraid. God is offering us a peace that the world cannot take away. Amen. It's not a domestic peace. The Bible is talking about a lot of times we have problems in our family because um, we're just not happy in our hearts. We don't know how much God has blessed us. And we're just never satisfied. I heard about this man in India. He lived in a hut with his wife, several children, and his parents-in-law. And the turmoil and the commotion, the distress, it was so much he couldn't take it anymore. There was a very wise guru in his village. And someone said, talk to the guru. Whatever he says to do, you do it. He's got answers for everything. So this man went to the guru and he said, I just can't take the turmoil in my family, just living in that house with all this ruckus and all the confusion. He said, it's just driving me crazy. He said, do you have a rooster? He said, I do have a rooster. He said, bring the rooster into the house with you and then come see me in a week. So he brought the rooster into the house and he came to see him in a week. He said, this hasn't helped at all. So the rooster's right there, he's making a mess, and he's waking us up early in the morning. And he said, he said, oh, <clears throat> we're not done yet. <clears throat> so 
said, you have a cow? I said, yeah, I have a cow. He's afraid. And he said, you need to bring the cow into the house with you for one week and then come and see me. And he said, this has made it worse than anything. He said, I don't want to describe what's going on in the house right now. This happened over several weeks until he had a goat and a pig and several other animals in the house with him. And finally he got exasperated and said, I'm not going to that teacher anymore. And he kicked out all of these critters. All of a sudden he felt pretty peaceful. <laughs> he just didn't know how to count his blessings. So sometimes peace is going to come from just having a spirit of thankfulness for what we do have trusting God with what our lot in life is. You know, ultimately, the Lord is offering us an eternal peace. In a minute, we're going to be singing about that peace. I just want to give you a heads up. There's a beautiful hymn, 466. If you've got a hymnal, you want to reach for that now. This will also give our musicians time to come up. Far away in the depths of, this, of my spirit... How many of you want to be in eternity? Do you know how God describes eternity? It's a place of peace. The Bible tells us in Psalm 37, verse 11, but the meek will inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Isaiah 11, verse 6, the wolf also will dwell with the lamb and a leopard will lie down with a young goat and a calf and a young lion and a fatling together and a little child will lead them. In Ezekiel 28, verse 26, and they will dwell safely there, build houses, plant vineyards. Yes, they will dwell safely and secure. God is promising us an eternity of peace, living in the new Jerusalem. But if you're going to have the peace there, then you must first experience that peace here now. If you're waiting for peace in the world, if you think the politicians are going to bring us peace, or the economists are going to bring us peace, or the counselors of the world are going to bring us peace, you're never going to feel that tranquility that Jesus is offering you. That real peace is only going to come as you invite the Prince of Peace to be the Lord of your life. You accept the forgiveness, the covenant of peace that he's made with us, and you'll enjoy that peace. We're going to sing about that now. And, oh, we do have some singers here. Why don't we stand together? We're going to sing 466. I think the words will be on the screen as well that wonderful peace.
that one strain of the song which the ransom will sing in that heavenly kingdom will be peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweet hope, my spirit, forever I pray. In the fathomless billows of love. I feel more peaceful already, don't you? You should all join the choir. You sound pretty good. The Lord wants you to have that peace. He doesn't want you to have anxiety. It's bad for you. It's bad for others. And the peace of heaven he wants you to experience now when you invite the gift of heaven, Jesus, into your heart. The angels sang, peace on earth. That's really talking about peace in us is what they're singing about, that Jesus came to bring. You can have that by inviting him into your heart right now, and I pray that's your desire. Let me pray with you. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the message of peace that Jesus brought into our world. From beginning to end, it was about reconciling us by breaking down that barrier of partition and restoring us to communion with yourself, Lord. I pray the Holy Spirit will enter every heart and mind and just give us that peace. In spite of what happens in the world, Lord, we know that we can have peace that is not subject to circumstances through Jesus. We're praying for that now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. Remember, on your way out, you're going to have our young pathfinders will be at the door. They're going to be giving you the special envelope. We have a special year-end offering that we receive. Uh, you may not be here next week. Our ushers will be here for, to receive your tithe and offerings at the door as well. God bless you. You have a happy Sabbath, and we'll see you next week. And don't forget the concert tonight, 7 o'clock.